Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is a wonderful turnout. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, we have several announcements, as we often do. First of all, thanks to Betsy um, uh, for filling in this morning. On very short notice, Karina was up all night delivering puppies. I mean, she wasn't having them personally, but her dog was. And she, <laughs> she, <laughs> so she has a well-deserved morning off, and uh, Betsy is wonderful to fill in for us. Uh, announcements are in the bulletin. You see Holy Week there. We need readers for what I said is Holy Thursday, or sometimes we call it Maundy Thursday, but there is a, we need eight readers. And the sign-up sheet is on the table over here if you'd like to read uh, at our communion service on Thursday evening of Holy Week, which is a week from this coming Thursday. Um, we would be happy to have you, and please uh, sign up so we know that. Uh, we have a letter that we sent to the Russian embassy that many people signed last week. If you didn't have a chance to sign it, um, we're going to also send copies to our congressional delegation and to the White House. And if you'd like to sign the letter and the, uh, the sign-up sheet uh, is, is in with a coffee in the Dignard Room. So we hope you'll uh, take advantage of that. Um, let's see. Table in the Dignard Room. We sent a letter to Vlad. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, we... He and I are on a first-name basis. I called him Boris one time, and he got very annoyed. Um, now, um, oh, I wanted to thank, the, there were a bunch of people that were here uh, yesterday, and they did a wonderful job of cleaning up. Uh, we found amazing things in the shed, uh, amazing things in the, in the attic of Nan's house, which included, many people have been wondering, I did actually graduate from college, and I can now prove it because my degree was up in the attic of Nan's house. I did actually graduate from seminary after college. That, that was up there, too. Um, and there was a third, oh, I am ordained by the Presbyterian Church. That was up there, too. So what a surprise to everyone. I mean, I, I, <laughs> no sign of those, fortunately. I think that was good. <laughs> Uh, oh, now back to uh, more mundane matters. We have a uh, ping pong table, uh, which we found in the shed. It's, it's really in good shape. Uh, there are some ping pong balls and net and paddles. And if anybody, did you want to take that home, Betsy? You don't need a ping pong table. There's one play ping pong. Oh. Okay. Well, if anyone would like to, you know, we're not selling it. We, we just have it. So if anybody would like, it's in the Dignard room. You can take a look at it uh, afterward. Okay. So we have, um, uh, next week we'll be collecting, uh, as we do annually, the one great hour of sharing. And uh, I, I asked uh, Craig if he would share with us uh, some thoughts about this. He served as a missionary at one point. Some of the, the money goes to missionaries. And it all goes to mission. And uh, so, Craig, if you'd like to share that, would be great. And probably you should use that mic there or, or come up here as one. Three weeks ago in uh, his sermon, Woody uh, talked about a parable. And uh, in that parable, a lawyer asked a question. Do you remember what that was? Who is my neighbor? Today, we have uh, ample evidence of who our neighbors, neighbors in need, are. Uh, we've been um, inundated uh, by images uh, on television and in newspapers uh, of the horrible uh, events in Ukraine. Uh, who is my neighbor? Well, um, our neighbor is those folks in Ukraine. Uh, we also read in our papers about natural disasters uh, across our country and the world. There our neighbors are once again. So um, who is our neighbor? Well, we know by now. Um, we can watch that news and listen to those reports and uh, begin to feel powerless. You know, how can we possibly make any uh, dent uh, in responding to those uh, crises around the world. And uh, it's, uh, it's possible to begin to feel uh, 
despair. Um, but this morning, I uh, offer a little lifeline uh, out of the despair, and our church offers a lifeline out of despair through the one great hour of sharing offering. Uh, these are envelopes that will be available this next week, uh, and then there's also an, another brochure about the one great hour of sharing offering that originated after World War II and uh, in, in the United States. And uh, to this day, there are still eight to 10 denominations which participate in the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. So you can imagine if we take uh, all the churches and 10 denominations and put them all together, uh, and they all take an offering together, uh, that can make a real difference. Not only that, but uh, this offering and, and many uh, offerings to the national churches uh, have very low overhead. That is most of what you give, in fact, 90 to 95 cents of every dollar that you give to uh, One Great Hour of Sharing gets to the point of need. And that's because the denominations um, provide the overhead, if you will. They, they pay for the printing and for the distribution and for the administration of these funds so that the money that we give uh, gets to uh, the people who are most in need. Living where we do, it can be uh, difficult to imagine, um, well, difficult to imagine what's uh, what it's like to live in a, in a basement in Ukraine for weeks uh, without food, without water, uh, what it's like to live uh, in poverty in various places around the world. Uh, Woody mentioned that uh, Ellen and I had uh, served uh, the wider mission of the church in Micronesia. This was a long time ago. Micronesia is uh, way out in the ocean, <laughs> 2,000 islands. You put them all together, they're the size of Rhode Island. They're spread out over an area of the ocean the size of the continental United States. Um, when the, Woody, Woody would love uh, playing baseball there because uh, uh, the kids reported that uh, they would set up home plate on one side of the island. <laughs> and a home run was when you hit the ball into the lagoon on the other side of the island. Um, so some of these islands were, were pretty tiny. We also, uh, in addition to learning about uh, baseball on an island, um, we also learned about poverty um, and had an opportunity very early on in our um, marriage uh, to see and experience that kind of poverty. We were responsible for keeping track of the kids at the school. It was a boarding school and one of one of the jobs, which I hated, but anyway, it was a job I had to do, was to inspect the kids' lockers to make sure, that, you know. Well, uh, uh, I can't say that I ever found anything that I wasn't supposed to find in those lockers, because in fact, one found almost nothing in those lockers. Uh, a shirt and a pair of pants. So I was in the boys' dorm, shirt and a pair of pants. Uh, and one knew that the other shirt and pair of pants they were wearing. And so they, you know, they had two shirts, two pairs of pants. They swapped them back and forth. And then the students just for, you know, for the sake of a little variety would trade the clothes amongst one another um, uh, just because they had, had so little. Um, so that made an early impression uh, on us in terms of what poverty is, is really like. Uh, and those, uh, those students uh, were certainly uh, in need and are served, uh, people like that are served through the one great hour of sharing offering. Uh, so the, the money will get to the point of need. Uh, we're certain that, it, that some good, goodly portion of it will be going to Ukraine. Um, so we invite you to, uh, to write a check. Write a check to the church, put in the memo, one great hour of sharing, and we will collect these checks and put them all together and send them off to uh, Presbyterian headquarters in Pittsburgh. And uh, we'll keep track and we'll let you know uh, how much money uh, we were able to raise uh, right here in 
in our little town, our little church, uh, for people in need around the world. There's a lovely prayer on the cover of this. If you would join me, let us pray. Thank you, God, for connecting us. Thank you for neighbors, each with needs and gifts to share. And for our church, the whole church, together, and for Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Craig. That was very nice and very meaningful. You all know what poor preaching is if you come here, but poverty is another thing financially, and he certainly raised that with looking in those lockers. That's an interesting point. And I did want to thank uh, uh, the Wednesday morning uh, study group that's been studying uh, the Psalms, and uh, they put together a kind of a modernized version of Psalm number 74. So when you get to the responsive reading, that's the insert in your bulletin. I think they did a very, very good job. I think the bulk of the work, uh, the heavy lifting there was, was Craig and Dick, but um, Dick Backus, but that was a wonderful um, job there and very timely. Okay, are there other announcements we should make? Yes, Rob. Wait, 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 wait. Use the mic because we... I just wanted to extend the welcome to anybody and everybody um, school age if they wanted to come for children's uh, Sunday school service after we're dismissed from Ribbon Woody we'll be going up the hall and having a class so you're welcome to come and that can be ages kindergarten and on and if you want to come too adults are welcome as well So I wanted to echo Woody's sentiments, thanking everybody that, that turned out for our cleanup day yesterday. If, uh, if you missed yesterday, we still have an opportunity for you to help. Um, we have a number of boxes up in the attic uh, that need to come into my pickup truck so I can get them to the transfer station. So um, we'll be probably in the Dignard room right after um, if you're interested in helping. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, great job there yesterday. Okay, anyone else? Yes, Lydia. Session meeting on Thursday, 7 o'clock. Okay, session meeting on Thursday, 7 o'clock. Any, any other announcements? Any birthdays, anniversaries, bar mitzvahs? Yes, Lydia. Kelly and I are celebrating 40 years tomorrow. 40 years of marriage? Wow. <laughs> That's exciting. There's one over there with you. Yes. So it's Scott over there, yes. We can't hear you. The world can't hear you. Microphone. Emily. Microphone. Oh, microphone. Microphone. Hold on, we're getting a microphone here. My daughter Emily is turning 14 this week. Okay. Josie had a birthday on St. Patrick's Day. She turned oh. 10. Okay. <laughs> Floyd is turning wise on Tuesday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Is there anyone not having a birthday? Uh. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's sing a happy anniversary and happy birthday. We have a, do we have a morning prelude? Okay, good. <laughs> Betsy's going to do something which will be the morning prelude. Okay.
We gather to worship a special God, the God of the universe who created all that is, and a God who walks with us through life, who celebrates with us on the good days, and who cries with us on the bad days. And let us begin to worship as we sing our opening hymn, which is number 433. <laughs> of reading, and again, thanks to the uh, study group of the Psalms who have made this uh, very relevant to our time. O oh God, why do you turn a blind eye to our daily news and eternal hopes for peace? Remember the hopes of us in your congregation and people scattered around the world which you created long ago. Direct your gaze to the ruins of Ukraine where Russia seems intent on destroying everything. At Mariupol, they have hacked off the faces of buildings with missiles and artillery. They set schools and hospitals on fire. They declare, we will utterly subdue them. How long, O oh God, is Vladimir Putin to scoff? Is this psychopath to revile treaties and fundamental human rights forever? Why do you hold back your hand? Why do you keep your cards close to your chest? Yet our God is eternal, desiring justice and peace for all creation. You, O oh God, cut openings for springs and torrents. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You establish the stars and the sun. You have fixed all the bounds of the earth. You made summer and winter. O oh God, you have done all this. Can't you see how autocrats around the world scuff at our democracy, scoff at our democracy, and encourage the fringes of our society to flirt with dictatorship? Protect us and protect the innocents in Ukraine and elsewhere. But don't let us forget there are also refugees in the Middle East, in Africa, in Central America, and even in the United States. Pay attention to their desperation and their great need, but there is a struggle No matter their customs, their language, their religion, their skin color, their poverty. Give the refugees from around the world welcome wherever they land, and don't make them feel abandoned, rejected, and less than human. Do you despair over the terrible crises we face? Don't. Don't despair, since there is so much suffering and wrong that needs attention to. Everywhere around the earth, the enemies of freedom of love, of compassion, and kindness are waging war in order to gain power and wealth to do as they please. Don't let them continue to rob the future of their own greed. Thank you. 
Let us join together affirming our faith on the historic words of the Apostles' Creed on the inside cover of our hymnals. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. All right, we're going to try to do this without having frogs, too. Our scripture reading is a fascinating one. 
and it's in the 11th chapter of John, beginning with the uh, 17th verse. Now, when Jesus came to Bethany, he found that Lazarus, who had been a good friend of his, had died and been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary sat in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to Jesus, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who is coming into the world. <clears throat> and when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying quietly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when Mary heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Then Mary, when she came to where Jesus was and saw him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of Lazarus, said to him, Lord, by this time, there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that you would believe? If you would believe, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I knew that thou hearest me always, but I have said this on account of the people standing by, that they may believe that thou didst send me. And when he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with bandages, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. And here ends our reading. Now, before we get to the, um, to the children's sermon, uh, let's take a moment to say good morning to those around you. If you don't know them, that's okay. Say good morning to them anyway. Wave, uh, fist bump, uh, whatever you want to do. <clears throat> well, as for a children's sermon, I just thought I would um, talk to kids about something. There are all, uh, we all of us in our lives have times when we feel alone. There's nothing, uh, perhaps, uh, that we, f no place we feel more alone than in a crowd of people where everybody knows each other. Whether it's the first time you come to a church and the people are there you don't know and you feel like, wow, is anybody going to say hello to me or is anybody going to welcome me or is anybody going to show me where the coffee is, or, you know, anything like that. Uh, I'm sure it's that way. It's been a long time since I first started school, even though I now have those um, degrees that I did find. I feel much better about it. But um, I thought maybe it was just my imagination that I had done that. But um, first day you go to a new school, you have new kids in your school, boy, there's nothing as difficult as the first day of first grade or readiness uh, or the first day in a new school, no matter what grade you're in. Um, one thing that kind of got me through some tough times was the idea that even 
if I was alone, God was with me. I guess I grew up in a house where I always kind of learned that. And that gives you a great feeling that someone is with you. And God's with you in, in two ways. God's with you. His spirit is with you. You can talk to him. Um, but God is also with you through the people at that place that welcome you and come up and talk to you themselves. And God wants us to do that for each other. When we see somebody that's lonely um, uh, or new, we don't make fun of them. We welcome them, and we make them part of the group. And I think that's, uh, that's an important lesson for all of us, uh, kids and adults. Um, we need to make more of our um, group feeling, I think, not just uh, in church, but the church needs to reach out and, um, and make everybody part of the group, whether they come to our church or another church or they don't go to church or they go to a synagogue or whoever they are, God loves them. God's with them. They may not even think about that or be aware of that, but um, God's with them in another way when we reach out and uh, befriend them, become their friends. So that's our children's sermon for today. Um, <clears throat> you come back when you're in town, Lynn. Um, well, I found, uh, you know, the weather's been very strange. It's, uh, you know, it was 70 degrees a couple weeks ago, and then it was 20 degrees this week, and the wind is blowing a lot. Have you noticed how much the wind is blowing this year? It's, um, so it's been really, you're looking for signs of spring. And um, I did find one recently. Um, I went to put my, uh, my shoes on, and I had a spider in my shoe. Well... I told him he looked silly. The shoes were way too big for him. So, but I was glad to see him because it was a sign of spring. I, I kind of bugged you, didn't that joke? But anyway, forget that. Uh, well, um, I think today's uh, scripture reading is another account that we often hear, but we miss the impact of it because, you know, we hear it in church, which is a nice, friendly place, and we don't think what that means. Um, I think it's a very significant uh, story, uh, and it really reveals who God is, I think, in a very, very human, a very important way. I mean, here you have Jesus' friends. These are his friends. These are not, quote unquote, disciples, not the official 12 there that they had, but these are friends of his. I mean, there's another story in the Bible where he, he goes to their house in Bethany and he was getting pretty well known at the time, so a lot of their neighbors and friends in town, the town of Bethany, a little bit outside of Jerusalem, uh, uh, came to see him. And so they all sat in the living room, all the men, and uh, Jesus was teaching them. But Lazarus, and Lazarus was in there with them, but his two sisters, women were not supposed to be taught under the uh, old, in Old Testament uh, at times. Uh, they were not to be taught to read or write. Um, they were uh, uh, more important for them to serve lunch. So one of the two sisters, I always get the two mixed up, but one of them goes out to the kitchen, starts making sandwiches. Here she got this living room full of people listening to Jesus, but her other sister stays uh, in the room where Jesus is teaching. So she's getting overwhelmed with trying to make sandwiches for all these people, so she comes back out to the living room. She says, hey, sis, come he says, come in here. Jesus, would you please tell my sister she's, she's not supposed to be in here. Send her out to the kitchen. I need help. Jesus was very understanding of that, but he said in a very kind way, well, she's chosen the better path. In other words, she's chosen to listen to my teaching, which was a significant step uh, in, in a long battle in the church for the equality of genders. I mean, that was a really significant thing he said there. We don't usually get that as being particularly significant. And I think uh, that's true with a lot of Bible stories because we hear them and we don't realize this is a real life situation being described. Um, so in the story of Lazarus, <clears throat> obviously we put a lot of emphasis whenever we talk about this on Jesus' power to resurrect Lazarus. He brings him back from the dead. Um, and by the way, just uh, 
as a little aside here, the verse uh, John 11:39 has an interesting translation in the King James Version of the Bible. You know, there are various translations. The King James Version, the, the one we read here from the Revised Standard Version says, uh, Martha, when he says, take the stone away from the place where he lay, she says, you know, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He's been dead four days. Uh, the King James Version reads, he stinketh. That's correct. But anyway, um, so they uh, take the stone away and Lazarus comes out and this is a great message. Uh, our God has revealed in that. He has the power uh, to bring life beyond life. But I think there's another verse just before that uh, that's just as significant, and we don't usually talk about that. Uh, Jesus knows he's, he, he can get Lazarus back out of the uh, tomb, but he feels the pain of Lazarus' sisters, of the many neighbors who love Lazarus, who are who are gathered around, they're all weeping, and he feels his own pain. This was his friend. And what does he do? Before he takes Lazarus, uh, calls him back out of the tomb, it's the shortest verse in the Bible, verse 35 of John 11. Um, Jesus wept. Imagine that. Jesus wept. Um, and I think that's a very important verse because it shows us that the God we worship is not some, uh, you know, lightning bolt throwing a, a creature up in the heavens who's indifferent to human beings at all. He feels our pain. He understands our sadness. He is with us on good days and bad days. He wept, he weeps with those who weep, and he celebrates with those who celebrate. In our Wednesday morning uh, study group on the Psalms, um, which is wonderfully carried on uh, with great guidance by uh, Craig, who is just a great teacher, um, we've come to realize that the book of Psalms, which is kind of a worship book, um, contains a lot of lamenting. You maybe even could uh, take the lamenting and, and uh, to put a more modern word to it, complaining. Uh, there's a lot of complaining by the uh, folks that wrote the Psalms, uh, understandably. Life is difficult. And uh, life was difficult then. Life is difficult now. Uh, it's very uh, truthful uh, when they complain about the pain they feel at points in life, just as we do. Uh, we feel pain in our personal lives, uh, you know, illness, somebody we love uh, dies, uh, terrible accidents occur, uh, terrible, uh, we feel lost some days, we don't know our purpose, we don't know, um, we feel lonely for some reason. We, uh, there's all kinds of reasons that we have days in which we feel like complaining. And you know what, that's okay. God understands that. God, um, God feels our pain. Um, and then there's the pain we feel together, which I think is beautifully expressed in the paraphrase they did of, um, of Psalm 74, uh, the, the members of the class, uh, for today's responsive reading. We feel pain together. Uh, when things happen like the Ukraine, when natural tragedies happen, when wars happen, when uh, on a big scale uh, the capital is taken over or uh, we see people yelling at each other um, at public meetings where we should be gathering uh, to, to decide what's, what's the right thing to do. Uh, we feel pain when we uh, see people mocking or take, uh, uh, making fun of or making judgments on people that are good people but have a different view of things. Um, in, the, in, the Psalm, in the Psalms, they talk about being in the pit. And I'm pretty sure that's where the more modern phrase comes from. You know, when you're having a bad day and somebody says, how are you? You might say, today's the pits. That's it. That's life. Life is sometimes the pits. 
Now, in today's world, um, we've had plenty of things to be in the pits about together. Um, the Ukraine is terribly powerful and terribly depressing when you watch television or look at YouTube and you see what's happening there. The pandemic uh, is not to be cons um, uh, considered uh, um, the same as another word, picnic. It's no picnic. It hasn't been for two years. It's getting better. Um, we live in a perilous economy. Went to the bank the other day. They said, uh, do you want a loan? I said, yes, I'm trying to fill up the car with gas. Um, it's, it's a perilous economy. It's a divided country we live in, in which we find ourselves. Um, but John 11.35 reminds us that God not only hears our laments or our complaints or our gripes, whatever we want to call them, um, he not only hears them when we offer them in prayer, he feels them. He, I'm sure, understands and weeps with us uh, for the Ukraine. It's a very sad situation. By the way, I meant to mention that if you'd like to sign that letter that we did send to um, my friend Vladimir there, um, uh, at the, through the Russian embassy, you can't mail something directly to Moscow these days, but if you haven't signed it yet, it's, uh, there's a copy of it uh, in with the coffee, and uh, you're certainly welcome to sign it. We'll send that off to our congressional leaders and our uh, president. Well, the scriptures also give us hope that even when things are seemingly hopeless, uh, they will be better. Um, many of the Psalms have their laments and then have uh, a new understanding, a little more optimistic tone. Things will get better. After the darkness, the sun will rise. Paul's words, which are some of my favorite words in the Bible, in the eighth chapter of, of Romans, it's a letter. We think of these things with all these numbers. I mean, that was a letter he wrote to a small group that he started a church with in Rome, and he's in jail. I mean, uh, it wasn't too popular with the government authorities to go to Rome and say there was a God other than Caesar. And Paul's in jail, but he says these words in his letter. He says, neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God promises to be with us in the pits and on the mountaintops. And he understands the days when we may feel that he doesn't exist or is a vindictive spirit punishing or abandoning us. We need to remember those words, Jesus wept. So let me just close um, these thoughts with some really great words. I, I read the letters to the editor of the paper, which shows I'm a glutton for punishment, but um, sometimes, but I came across this marvelous letter in the Monday paper. And so uh, as I was thinking about my sermon all week, I thought, Man, I think maybe I'll use this. So I called information. Fortunately, this fellow had a listed phone number. Um, his name was Mike Fischler, who wrote this letter. He's in Holderness. I called him up. We had a wonderful discussion on the phone. He was glad I called, he said. And, and um, uh, he's a really bright man. And it was his birthday Friday when I called, so that was kind of nice. But here's his letter. And I think um, it talks about one of the greatest obscenities in human history. Now, this man is Jewish that wrote the letter. To the editor, as we struggle to uncover vital lessons from the ongoing tragedy in Ukraine, it would be wise to consider the response of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, a spiritual leader who during an, during an earlier genocide, Holocaust, watched the world he grew up in, his teachers, community, friends, and family obliterated while the world around him did nothing. He came to see his life task as helping individuals to recognize the cost of living in a world where indifference was rampant. Heschel often encountered individuals who would question him relative to where was God during the Holocaust? He once responded, where was God, you ask? 
Why are you bringing that question to God? So you want to say to God, where were you? God's answer is, where were you? This author, biblical scholar, and civil rights activist who marched arm in arm with Martin Luther King teaches us that God doesn't work alone but needs each of us to act as partners if reason and healing is to prevail. For each of us, it's time to partner up with God or spirit or whatever higher power or ethical principle guides you and to find a way to turn aspirations into actions. What can you commit to do today and then during each tomorrow to contribute toward healing Ukraine, our nation, our disparate lives, and toward repairing this broken world. God, spirit, your higher powers, our democracies, and each of us need you to be their partners and need your partnership now. The words of Mike Fischler and Abraham Heschel. Um, uh, Mike lives up in Holderness, so I thank him for allowing me to use that. So let us remember that God weeps with us and celebrates with us and promises to be with us as we prepare to celebrate his supper. And uh, we prepare as we sing hymn number 571. table is not the community church table, it is not the Presbyterian church table, it is the Lord's table, and all are invited to partake in his meal. And if you've not celebrated communion with us, uh, we have both bread and uh, gluten-free uh, crackers uh, on these trays, and we also have uh, in these trays, when you get to the wine, grape juice and wine, um, and take whatever is appropriate for you. Scriptures tell us that on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus had supper with his disciples, supper we shall 
commemorate on Holy Thursday with communion. And after they had eaten together, he took bread and blessed it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is about to be broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he gave it to them. He said, this cup represents my blood, which is about to be shed for all of you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth my death until I come again. Let us bow together in prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we confess before you our sins, both those we have committed and those uh, times when we should have done something to show someone's love and understanding and hope, and we fail to do so. We ask your forgiveness for times that we have joined in our lives with groups that were making fun of people because they look different or had different beliefs, different skin colors, different gender identities, and all the things that we human beings use to separate us instead of celebrating that we are all a part of the human family which you have created. We ask your forgiveness. And we ask your presence with us as we celebrate this meal, which reminds us of the depth of your love. Reminds us that shortly after you shared this meal, you were arrested, you were mocked, you were whipped, and you were nailed to a cross, and your first words there were, Father, forgive them. We ask your forgiveness for us and for your world. May we all come together and create a new world of peace and compassion and justice. We ask for your blessing as we ponder these things, as we celebrate your meal. In Jesus' name we ask. Jesus said, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
We drink this in memory of Jesus of Nazareth. Now let's join together in the prayer Jesus taught us praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Continue to worship as we share our morning gifts. Savior 
God, our Lord, we thank you for your blessing. We ask for your presence, and we ask for your support that we may work with you to make the world a better place. Bless these our offerings, and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And our closing hymn is number 642. Thank you. 
the world in peace, be of good courage, render to no one evil for evil, support the weak and help the afflicted and honor all as children of God. And may God bless us each and every one in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.